feeling of deja vu. Anyway, we're here in Portugal, at the Estoril circuit, at the end of the GT4 RS launch, which is a bit of a problem because I haven't actually driven the car yet. And it's a launch where they've been telling people that this is a car for circuit driving, for quick Sunday morning blasts. This is not a car for driving thousands of miles in, which could be a bit of an issue because we're gonna drive this car one and a half thousand miles back to Stuttgart in Germany. Now, this is the first time I've seen GT4S in the metal and carbon, and it is a really good looking thing. There's some details which I've already seen, which I'm, I'm particularly enjoying. I love the little grills and the lights there, this larger front splitter down here. But what I really like is on the front arches around here, which I, I hadn't really picked up in photos somehow. These slashes at the top, which are really reminiscent of a 911 GT1. They in fact work with the knacker ducts in the bonnet here for cooling the brakes. So the air goes in there, comes out and it's helps sort of with the exit out here. Down the side, this has got the Vysac pack on it, so we've also got magnesium wheels, which are extra on top of the Vysac package, but save two and a half kilos. Super cool, love magnesium wheels. Then these extra sort of bits to help funnel the air in here. Looking forward to hearing how it sounds. And I love the fact that for the first time, you can actually see the engine through that rear window. Other little things as well, Porsche scripts you'd normally have on an RS sort of along the rear wing here, but it sort of would be a bit awkward with the swan necks here. So they've got it actually sort of within the glass there on the rear screen. Overall, super cool. I love it in the silver as well, reminiscent of those GT3 Cup cars. Anyway, it's enough chatting, time to get on the road. With the 911 GT3's amazing 4-litre naturally aspirated flat 6 spun through 180 degrees and squeezed into the Cayman's sublime mid-engine chassis, this is a car that promises to be pretty special. But can it live up to the hype? Will it be too track biased, too Ren Sport for the road? Despite starting at £108,000, will it still feel somehow lesser compared to its rear-engine sibling? We've got two and a half days to find out, and although we need to traverse a big chunk of Western Europe from Lisbon to Stuttgart in the process, we'll still hopefully take in some interesting roads along the way. As it was already evening when we left Estoril, I decided to get some motorway miles under the Cup 2s, 24535 ZR20s at the front, 29530 ZR20s at the rear in case you're interested, and head for Spain. We arrived in the pretty university city of Salamanca late at night, and then we left again early in the morning. All of this time saving, however, meant a few hours later I could get a little off the beaten track as we headed west through northern Spain. It's fun just popping off the motorway occasionally and coming onto some of these sort of side roads because I've always been sort of fascinated by the middle bit of Spain because we always tend to stick to the, the edges really, either up in the Pyrenees or sort of the coastline, Barcelona or down by sort of Almeria, that sort of area down there. And there's sort of nothing in the middle, but it's also really rather beautiful somehow. And you get these incredible, just long, straight, empty roads. It's amazing. The engine in this feels a bit like, well, it's, it's sort of, if you've ever had a friend that's moved abroad, and then a year later you speak to them and they've sort of picked up bits of the accent from being abroad. It's, it's a little bit like that, I think. It's familiar, but just a little bit different in character. <laughs> it is basically exactly the same as before. So we've got 500 horsepower, so 493 brake horsepower, 332 pounds foot of torque, and it's the same four litre naturally aspirated flat six, and it's absolutely glorious. The 10 brake horsepower deficit compared to a 992 is apparently just because of the slightly longer exhaust that's required because the engine is further forward and there is a touch more back pressure as a result. However, at 1,415 kilos, the Cayman counters this with a marginal 20 kilo advantage over a PDK GT3, meaning Porsche lists the power-to-weight ratios of the two cars 
as identical. The interior of the GT4 RS is worth talking about briefly too, with its combination of analogue and digital dials and touchscreen and physical buttons, it feels like the perfect ergonomic blend. It's nice because this is apparently the first time that a Porsche has had this sort of race tech or Alcantara to UMB on the dash, which makes total sense because it's obviously anti-glare and it just adds a, a nice sort of softness to the whole cabin, makes it feel special but also quite warm in here, which is nice. Actually, as we've got a long straight piece of road and uh, there is absolutely nobody around, I think I'm going to stop to do a quick acceleration run. Not normally a big one for doing straight up acceleration runs, but I think this could be pretty special actually. So, left foot on the brake, uh, PDK Sports, ESC and TC off that. Right, here we go. Two seconds, not 62 miles an hour in 3.4, but the 0 to 60 3.2, which for people of my generation means a lot because that is the McLaren F1's 0 to 60 mile an hour time. <laughs> that was good. I know some electric cars might be quicker, but that was an exciting 0 to 60. <laughs> right. Time to cover a bit more ground and go and find a few twistier roads, I think. Now, normally I would just head to the perfect Porsche playground of the Pyrenees, but at this time of year, well, it's a little tricky. Lightly treaded track tyres and snow do not a good pairing make. Luckily, just to the west of the mountains, there is a road I've wanted to visit for a while, and which is arguably even more appropriate for this naturally aspirated 718 Cayman. This road has literally got this car's name on it. Wow, look at that view! I was starting to wonder whether we'd made the right decision to drive all this way across Europe. But the chance to drive this piece of road in this car is absolutely worth it. What a piece of road, what a car. This is fun with very much a capital L. Instantly the RS felt at home being driven hard and I felt comfortable with it. With both the ESC and TC turned off, it felt so predictable and playful, doing that Porsche thing of feeling like it's gripping even when it's slipping. I've been leaving the PAS on the adaptive dampers just in their normal setting, they're perfect on this road in that setting. I have tried them in the firmer setting and actually it's quite nice in some ways because you get a bit more sort of that race car feel. But to be honest, yeah, their normal setting is, is best. Pins galore. It's just so playful this car, the chassis is so on your side. They've got just a quarter of a degree more camber at the rear apparently. This has got a mechanical limb slip diff and it's still got PTV via braking. Which I'm always a bit worried about because you can't turn it off. But Equally, you can't really feel it either. Compared to a non-RS Cayman GT4, this has a 6mm wider track at the front and an 8mm wider track at the rear. It has helper springs, ball joints all round, and the tracking, camber and anti-roll bars can all be individually adjusted. The chassis on this is just so much fun, and that engine... <laughs> it is amazing. It's so loud in here, but just so intoxicating. Felt like the right thing to do to put the harnesses on for this piece of road. I know some people think that harnesses in a road car are stupid, but I love that feeling of just being sort of properly locked into the seat. 
particularly when the seat's as good as this. The beautiful, supportive, but surprisingly comfortable Carbon 918 style buckets are standard on the RS, by the way. Like all the best roads, you've got really good side lines on here. It's narrow, which keeps it really interesting. It's a very Pyrenean sort of road. As you can probably tell, the road also laid on a variety of weather just to test the car that little bit more. Personally, I loved it in the wet. It was stable, tactile and controllable even when it was sliding. I don't really need to say very much. I mean, you can hear, can't you? You can see by the smile on my face. You just need to listen to that engine. I know this hasn't got the double wishbone front suspension and the e diff and the rear wheel steering of the latest 992 GT3, but am I missing them? No, <laughs> not a bit. Yes, I love the 911. I love that rear engine balance, but the friendliness of this, the size of this, it just feels like a smaller car. It is a smaller car. The short gearing, the shortest gearing ever fitted to a GT department car. This is going to be up there with the best GT cars ever. The best sports cars ever. join me for breakfast in the pit lane of another circuit that I'm not going to drive because it's closed today um, so just before you get your hopes up um, it's the Sherard circuit near Clermont Front which is somewhere I have always wanted to visit and it is absolutely beautiful it's amazing sort of in this sort of dell on this hillside up here and it's known as a sort of always known as a little Nürburgring potentially even twister even faster actually in places but I want to stop here Partly because, as I say, this is a little Nurburgring, so it gives me an opportunity to mention the Nurburgring lap time of this, which is 7 minutes 4 seconds uh, 0.511 to be accurate. That's the old lap, the slightly shorter lap, but it's, it's one that we can actually sort of relate to. A mighty impressive time, 23.6 seconds quicker than a standard Cayman GT4. Some of that's obviously down to the Cup 2 R rubber that this was on, but nonetheless, mighty impressive for a Cayman, I think you will agree. Also in here, because obviously we're out of circuit, just a couple of things, the roll cage in there. Vice hack pack this has means that is in titanium, saving six kilos, and it's just cool because it's titanium. The other thing is going into the front of the car. These are linseed, otherwise known as flax seed. And something I thought was quite interesting is that on the club sports, so the racing version of this, they've used an awful lot of what's known as NFC, or natural fibre composite, using flax in it. And I thought, well, that would be really cool to use it on this. It is just a tiny bit heavier, but it's kind of negligible. And I thought for all the, the sort of environmental reasons that it's good, it would be lovely to have it on this. However, there is a reason they haven't used it, and it's because the finish of it isn't actually quite as good as this. It's just, it's a bit rough. And it doesn't matter for a race car where you slap a livery on it and nobody's looking that closely anyway, but they thought for customers, they certainly still wouldn't be quite ready for that sort of finish on their road cars. Hopefully in the future, they can get it, well, as good as this lovely carbon fiber. And then all this front end could be made from NFC. Anyway. That's enough talking. Um, I will finish my Panorazan and then we've got another road to visit. After all that enthusiasm the day before, I decided to have a good think about what I didn't like about the GT4 RS. And after a little while, I alighted upon the fact that the larger rear wing obstructs the view in the rear view mirror. That was pretty much it. Oh, and I did wonder how much the reduction in unsprung mass from the costly carbon brakes and mag wheels on this particular car might be helping. 
Perhaps the ride is terrible if you don't spend the tens of thousands of pounds extra. I somehow doubt it. The road we're going to today, or going by it today, is a little bit random, but it does have the advantage that it's taken us off the auto route. And France, it's easy to forget because it's easy just to go through France on the auto route, on the payage, and miss out on all these amazing D roads that just crisscross the country. Since yesterday, I've been thinking obviously a lot about that drive up on the 718 in Spain. And one of the things I've been thinking about is the gearbox because I was wondering, well, you know, would it have been better with a manual gearbox? Now, this apparently couldn't have a manual gearbox because the one from the GT3 is too long, it just packaging wise wouldn't have worked. If they put the one from the GT4 in, that wouldn't have really worked either because it couldn't take 9,000 RPM and it's not very easy to change the ratios, so it looks like we'd have been stuck with those tall ratios, whereas this is obviously fantastic because it's got these short ratios in this PDK box. Just to give you some idea how much shorter the ratios are, here's a quick comparison. In a GT4 with a manual transmission in second gear at 8,000 RPM, you would be doing 83 miles an hour. In a GT4 with PDK, you would be doing 77 miles an hour. Now, in this new RS in second gear at 9,000 RPM, you are doing just 72 miles an hour. That stat alone would seem to justify the paddle shift, although in many ways, paddle shift seems a misnomer in this car. I barely use the paddles in this RS, which is strange because I've not always migrated to using a lever when I've had the chance, but this one feels really good. I don't know if it's just because it feels so like a manual shifter with that Alcantara and just the shape of it and everything. The short little stubby throw on it feels perfect. It really does add another layer of engagement. I mean, these have never been the best paddles because they're pretty smart and dinky, although the way they actually work is quite nice, but it's not very theological. This just feels ace. It really does let you live out those touring car or rally car sequential shift fantasies. No, you don't have the three pedal dance, but there is still the extra little bit of thought required when you take your hand from the wheel. And yet, it is still easier to reach out for that 9000 RPM red line, which has to be a good thing. Those chips. <laughs> I haven't even got the loud exhaust on, you just don't need it most of the time. You get all the different noises, those throttle bodies, wow. Right, time to go and find our road. And the road is the D981. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound, you know, if you're going to do one road named after a box draw Cayman, then why not another? All right the other way around, which came first, road and car. Pretty sure it was the road. Now obviously, this is the fact that 982, it's called the 718 for sort of various historical and marketing reasons, but it's 982. The 981 though is where this started because there is a 981 GT4 RS, but it's just a prototype. You see, when they did the GT4, Wolfgang Hatz, who was head of Porsche R&D at the time, said, you must try and put the GT3 engine in it but it wouldn't fit because it was a, an, an oil tank associated with the dry sump system that just, it, it wouldn't fit in around the body of white. So they, they would have taken a huge amount of, sort of re-engineering for production, but they did make a prototype for his birthday and it was so much fun. That's what made them think we must put it into production for the next time round. So when they re-engineered the G3 engine, they re-engineered the uh, offending oil tank, made it a composite so that it would fit and you didn't have to cut away all the body. So there we go. <laughs> I like little stories like that. Oh, and it did have the intakes and the windows as well. Anyway, now we need to make a beeline for Stuttgart. We've got a long way to go. With daylight receding once more, I set off on the 400 kilometers to Strasbourg, 
arriving at another hotel after midnight before getting up early the following morning to head the final 150 kilometers to Stuttgart. A quick early morning run on some de-restricted autobahn, a splash of fuel, a couple of corners on its home roads near Weissach, and then I delivered it back to the factory. Badge streaked with grime, arch vents littered with detritus, titanium exhaust, dirty in both sound and appearance. Evidence of an epic road test. After 2,700 kilometers, over 1,700 miles, there seemed no better place to finish than here, in the Porsche Museum, with this, an original 718 RS. But what to conclude about the GT4 RS? After all those different roads, that incredible road in Spain, what can we conclude about it? Well, I think it's even better than I thought it was going to be. I mean, on paper, obviously, the mixture of the 718 chassis and its fabulous balance with the emotional performance of that GT3 engine, it's a match made in heaven. How could it go wrong? But I think the execution is just so good because it's rawer than I even dared hope it might be. The way you hear everything from that engine, because it's right in there with you inside the car, is just brilliant. It's, it's almost the sort of car you don't expect to find today. And the fact that it has the analog dials and things like that, it, it just feels so special. I think this is a car that sits right up there in the pantheon of great Porsches, more than worthy of a place in the museum one day alongside its ancestors. And I suppose the real test is, would I, given the chance, want to go right back to the start straight away and do that journey all over again. Yes. Yes, I would. Ooh. Strange feeling of deja vu. Yeah.